Klimt is not only um, proclaiming himself as the painter of, the, of this work, but he's also drawing attention to influences on his work and trends at the time. Hello, my name is Sarah Herring and I'm Associate Curator here at the National Gallery. And today I'm going to ask the question, why do artists sign their works of art? And we're going to have a look at this painting by Gustav Klimt, his portrait of Hermione Gallia. Here, the signature is particularly prominent. It's at the top right of the painting. He's signed it um, in a kind of purple-blue box or square, and he's used a gold lettering. So the words Gustav Klimt appear on two lines in rather angular lettering, and he's lined up the two words exactly. And the date, 1904, which appears at the bottom of the box, he's also lined up exactly with the letters. He's actually split the numbers in order to do that. It wasn't new for artists to make such a feature of their signature, but I want to, ex to have a look at this signature in relationship to trends at the time. So Gustav Klimt was the leading artist in Vienna in the early 20th century. He was a founding member of and the first president of the Vienna Secession, founded in 1897, which promoted modernism in art and painting and interior decoration. Um, he was one of the first to break down the hierarchy between applied art and fine art. He also designed textiles and furniture, and his lifelong companion, Emilia Flöger, was a fashion designer. He was also involved in the Wiener Werkstätte, which was, had been um, founded in 1903, the Vienna Workshops, which made and designed textiles and furniture and jewellery. The sitter, Gallia, was from a Jewish family and her husband, Moritz Gallia, was president of the Austrian Lighting Company. And they formed part of the um, cultured middle classes of Vienna and they commissioned paintings and patronised artists such as Gustav Klimt. And they lived in a newly built apartment on Good Living Street and they commissioned this painting from Klimt in 1903 to hang in Hermione Gallia's boudoir and also in that boudoir was furniture that they would commissioned from Josef Hoffmann, who was one of the leading figures in the Wiener Werkstätte. And the furniture was white, and obviously the white of the furniture and the white of her dress were supposed to harmonise. And the walls of the boudoir were covered in a blue silk, and at intervals on the silk was um, a little motif of a rose, a stylized rose, set in a square. So one of the aims of the Wiener Werkstätte was um, the complete work of art, so such an, an interior or a building where everything harmonised. Gallia died in 1936. The family had converted to Catholicism, but in 1938, when Austria was annexed by Germany, they had to flee. And the family actually moved to Australia, and they were able to take with them this portrait the furniture de designed by Josef Hoffmann and also the collection of objects designed by the Wiener Werkstätte. And in fact, these objects and the furniture now reside in the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. So let's have a look at the portrait itself. It's a mixture of the organic and curvilinear forms that were a hallmark of Art Nouveau, which was a trend um, at the late, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, and also geometric forms. So Gallia is standing, looking at the spectator. Her head is tilted to one side and her hands are clasped. I think she looks very serious. She's wearing a beautiful translucent dress. The train brought round to the front. Around her neck is a white burra and she's also wearing an over jacket with these full sleeves decorated with these, with these horizontal bands of white ribbons. And she has a pink sash around her waist and also very, very th thin pink ribbons around her wrists. The train, has, as I said, is brought round to the front in this grateful, graceful sweep, but it's decorated with these opaque white squares, and down the centre of each square there's a bright strip of white paint. On the whole, it's painted very, very thinly and very delicately, but what really stands out are the jewels at her bodice, which are painted with a fair degree of impasto. The dress that she's wearing is possible that um, it was designed by Klimt himself. It's a reform dress, which was fashionable at the time, and it was a reaction against the constricting clothes of the 19th century. So it's very loose, very flowing, very artistic. 
The dominant tonality of the painting is silvery. It's painted in a, in a, a range of whites and greys. And even the carpet um, at, the, at the bottom has this silvery tonality. So grey strokes of paint are brought down from the wall over the carpet. And I wanted to have a look at this a bit more closely because it has a very distinctive geometric pattern made up of circles and squares, um, rather like a mosaic. And it is said that um, it is inspired by the 5th and 6th century mosaics um, in the Italian city of Ravenna, which Klimt visited in 1903. But it's also possible that this carpet is a homage to Josef Hoffmann himself, who, as I said, was a leading figure in the Wiener Werkstätte and who was one of the first to really move away from organic forms towards geometric, where he used squares and circles and a grid-like pattern in his work. It is also true that the Wiener Werkstätte had their own monogram, which the two Ws were set, first of all with an oval and then into a square. And all the designers for the Werkstätte, Klimt included, had their own monograms, which are set within squares. Also, the secession artists, again, Klimt included, had these monograms. So here, um, rather than use his own monogram, Klimt has actually set his signature within the square. In another portrait of the same period of Emilia Fleurger, he, he added underneath the signature his own monogram. But here, as I said before, he's differentiated the signature with this purple-blue tonality, which, which sets it apart from the background of the picture. And this is also due to another factor. And these were Japanese woodblock prints from the Edo period, and these were produced from the 17th to the 19th centuries. And there, on those prints, artists signed their names vertically in boxes which were coloured differently from the rest of the print. And also sometimes they would add their seal. These prints were immensely important and influential on, on painting in the late 19th century in European art. And Klimt himself collected such prints and he hung them on the walls of his studio. So let's return to the question why do artists sign their work? Primarily, it's a stamp of authorship, a proclamation of yourself as the author of this work. And I think in this signature, because it's such a, a particular design feature in the painting and it stands out so much from the rest of the painting, Klimt is not only um, proclaiming himself as the painter of, the, of this work, but he's also drawing attention to influences on his work and trends at the time. And for the sitter, Gallia, having been painted by a painter such as Gustav Klimt, would have reinforced her standing and status in Vienna society. Of course, this painting was painted for a private apartment and hung in a private interior, but there were visitors to the, to the apartment who would have seen the painting, they would have seen that it was by Gustav Klimt and they would have noticed the signature as well. So for Hermione Gallia and her husband, this painting and Klimt's overt signature is not just a question of Klimt loudly proclaiming himself as the author, it also confirms themselves and their own status and judgment. If you would like to find out more about art history, please click here or here and subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.